have a Nissan Leaf, a 2014 model, the battery is down 50%. I'm getting around 40 miles on a charge. I am replacing stock batteries with cattle batteries, 16.4 volts each. That's 24 of them, which is going to give me 393 volts. I'm going to show you all the steps to get these batteries installed properly. Step number one, preparation. These are the socket wrenches that we need. 10 millimeters in various depths, 13 millimeters, 16 millimeters, and 18 millimeters for the main bolts. Two three-ton hydraulic jacks. A moving dolly with modifications raising the level slightly higher than the hydraulic jack lifts. After disconnecting the 12 volts battery under the hood, disconnect the main cutoff switch located in the back seat center under the cover. I will be using four of these six-ton jack stands to hold the car up. The back of the car is raised at the center axle and stands are placed under the wheel supports. The front can be raised by the center crossover chassis bracket. The stands are placed on the chassis outer edge. Now let's take out the battery. First, remove the plastic protection cover starting from the front to the back. The two type of fasteners here are 10 millimeter screws and push clip fastener. I placed a marker on all the push clip fasteners to make it easier when I will reinstall them again. Now I can remove four bolts, two at the front of the battery and two at the back end. At the front, I will also remove the two ground straps and also the bracket. For the main power line, there are three connectors to the battery to disconnect. I'm not going to go into detail how to remove them as it can be a bit of a challenge. Finally, I can get my battery dolly centered and position the two hydraulic jacks before I remove the final six bolts holding the battery up. With the remaining six bolts removed and the dolly properly positioned, I'm ready to drop the battery. It's best if both jacks lower at the same pace to keep the battery leveled and aligned. But let me also show you another angle where it drops unevenly. It still makes the landing without any problems. The jacks are an excellent substitute when you don't have a hydraulic lift. Now I pull the battery out for the next level for the modification replacement process. To remove the cover, I need to remove the 10 millimeters bolt securing the top of the case. There are about eight of them. This is the easiest part. There is also six more at the center where the high voltage cutoff switch is. The next task is the most difficult, breaking the rubber gasket seal between the top and bottom. First, I started out by trying to cut it with a box cutter. This took a while. And a while, and a while. Then next, I tried to chisel it apart with a hammer. Then I went back again to the razor knife idea. And after a lot of time, I finally was able to release the top cover. Now I can finally begin clearing the interior of the battery case by removing all the components and extracting all the stock battery modules. After running a few voltage tests, I have identified which are the main high voltage output cables. To make this process safer, it's best to remove the center cables and components before removing the individual modules. Disconnect the BMS plugs to prevent damage to the BMS module during the removal. Also, it may help to use a marker and make small marks on the connector plug and socket to identify the connections later on. Even though the cutoff switch is disconnected, there is still high voltage and extreme care should be taken. Wear rubber gloves and be careful with using your tools as to avoid any accidents when removing screws, cables, and components. The removal becomes safer as each cable and part gets disconnected from the modules. Also, do not throw away anything. All of these parts will be repurposed or can be sold after. Everything must come out inside the case, including all brackets and screws. Now I can remove the module braces, then move on to disconnecting the front and side modules. Keep in mind there is still high voltage between the cells and the back modules are the most complicated and have the most weight. They will get disconnected last. Disconnect each module bus bars using a 10 millimeter socket and a Phillips screwdriver for the BMS connection. Afterwards, you will be able to pull out each module out of the case, pull of the plastic cover and repeat the process on the next group of modules. They weigh around nine pounds each. This is the easiest way to remove them one by one. The 24 remaining modules at the rear weigh 192 pounds. The only way I could get them out was by flipping the case over and letting them drop out on the ground. Because of the way they are attached together, it was impossible to disconnect them inside the case. 
Now I need to clear the remainder items inside the case in order to make room for the new batteries. I will remove the silver bottom plates and the rest of the orange bus bars that are stuck under the center case crossbar. This entire disconnection process had taken around four hours to complete. With the case now empty, it's time for the next step, that is to modify the case for the new modules to fit in. To make room for the new modules, I use a metal cutter grinder to remove some of the excess metal in the case. The most important part here is where the rear modules will fit. The rear crossbeam, which is hollow, needs half its width removed. I realize the bottom lip that's flat on the case does not need removal, as well as the one at the back also can be left there. It only affects the height by around two millimeters. On the center module space, there are three posts near the outsides, on both the left and right side of the case. The one post at the back end for each side will remain, while the other two I remove since they will be in the way. The one remainder post will fit into the new module to prevent it from shifting. After the cutting, the case is washed and dried. Then I paint it inside where it was cut, to prevent any future metal rust. I have placed all the new modules into the case correctly. At the front are four modules on each side sitting on their sides. The center holds six modules, and the back holds five modules, stacked on each level as 10 modules in total. Let me show you now the diagram of how all these 24 modules will be connected. Starting with number one on the right center, connects to number two on the back top layer. Then two jumps to three bottom, and number three to number four, and keeps repeating until we get to 12th. The other side of 12th connects to one end of the service switch. The other end of the service switch connects to 13th. Then again they connect sequentially, jumping from 18th to 19th and continuing until they get to number 24. Then the output ground from 24th will connect to the relay box, while the positive output of number 1 will connect to the positive side of the relay box. Please note the position of the plus and minus terminals here is very important in order to avoid a major fire and damage to the entire battery. Starting at the front, I need to connect the bottom jumper cables first before I bolt the four modules together with long threaded rods. Otherwise, it will be difficult to attach the cables near the bottom battery posts. I'm using a 4-gauge flexible cable for all the modules, which I have cut and soldered the ends with an 80-amp copper ring terminal connector. I installed the HV output connector now, because I need to make sure it will fit in properly with the new batteries before the modules are secured in place. Then moving down the line to the center modules, measuring the jumper cable lengths, and creating all of the 20-some terminal jumper cables. I made a strap to secure the center three modules, which is tied from the case crossbar to the front ridge of the rear modules. It's important to make sure these modules will not move or shift around when the vehicle is driven. Between the modules, I made small metal brackets. They tie the modules to each other. This makes a stronger support bond for the batteries. And at the ends, a bracket connects the module to the casing. This way, I expect no movement when hitting a bump on the road. At the back section, I completed adding the jumper cables to the bottom row of modules. Here I placed longer threaded rods in between the modules, then added the small joining plate to tie all the modules together. This again will prevent any movement or shifting when the car is moving. The bolts needed to lock in each jumper is a 10M or 10 millimeters. I realized later on it's the same size screw that was used in the original leaf battery. Continuing from the back to the center and front again, I'm tying up all the cells together before I install the center relay components. After the jumper cable is tightened, I add tape over the connection to prevent any accidental shorts or shocks when working on these cells. Here is another view of one of the jumpers I am installing. Originally, I was going to use bus bars that I made for the connections, but then I noticed the insulation was too weak. The original cable for the heater pads needs to be added into the system in order to avoid error messages later on. I remove all the plugs that used to feed into the heating pads. This will help to save a little bit of room as I don't need them. Only keeping the plugs on the ends that feed into the heater relay and the front of the battery. Also installing the original cable with temperature sensors across different battery sections. With all the modules connected in series, I will reuse some of the original cables to connect the output wires. Also the service cutoff switch to the two modules. I'm ready for the relay box, but when I try to install it, the space is very tight. I can't get it in. I will have to disconnect two of the battery jumpers to make room for the relay box to slide in. Here's another heating pad connector I don't need. 
Next, the bottom front bracket is attached, but it needs a bit of bending in order to fit in better. Then the high voltage bus bar from the relay box to the output connector are secured in place. Now I connect the positive output cable from battery module number one to the relay box, as well as module 24, negative output cable to the relay box, exactly as shown now. Then finally, the last crossover bus bar is taken from the original battery, connected between number 18 and 19. Finally, the last step in this assembly is connecting the BMS module. There are four connectors on the bottom and two connectors on the side. It's designed with different type of plugs, so you can't get it wrong by inserting a plug into the wrong socket. One of the connectors on the side is for the temperature sensors. The BMS cable is marked on each plug for the corresponding module number. After routing the cable to all the modules, the wires are cleaned up and organized. Now we are ready for a quick voltage test. I temporarily connect the service disconnect plug into the center and test the final outputs. This validated the total current voltage and confirms everything is properly connected. Ready to start closing the battery. Before we close the cover, I want to show you how I secured and protected the modules. I repurposed the original bracket and strapped it to the back holding all of them in place. The center are also tied together and strapped down and bolted to the case. Then moving to the front, I secured the four modules by the connecting threaded rod to the existing case post with a nut. The other side I made a small bracket, tied it to the case post, then strapped it to the module bottom rod. To prevent a short between the cover and the connections, I reused the plastic from the heaters and attached plastic covers on all exposed top connections. This includes the center modules and the back tops. This step to seal the connectors is very important as they will be rubbing against the metal case top when it's closed. Taping them is not enough protection and a short with the case will destroy the battery and set the car on fire. You see, the problem is these new batteries are slightly taller than the original cells. And when the case cover is closed, the will be compressed by the case top. And you must observe extreme caution to protect all the connectors from touching any part of the metal casing. There is a gap of about 20 millimeters at the center now because the new modules are a bit taller. There are two options to deal with this. One is to cut the top of the case, reshape the center portion, then weld the metal plates back in or option two is apply a 20 millimeters gasket in between and seal the case with the gasket installed. I chose to go with option two since it's less complicated. This was the biggest foam gasket I could find at my local hardware store. Now I apply the sealant on the top cover, then apply as much as I can to the bottom. After bolting down the cover, more seal is added. This process is critical to keep moisture out and prevent water damage or a short inside the battery case. Once the sealant is complete, I add a metallic tape around the center to provide additional sealing support. One of the greatest challenges I had was to find these extended bolts. This is the original bolt that is used to attach the battery case to the frame of the car. Also, these 20 millimeter spacers will be required on all the bolts to mount the battery properly should also mention the other bolts for the case top need to be longer. Now let's get the battery back in the car. The battery's position must be exact. Because I'm using two jacks, this makes it a bit more tricky to get it back in. I'm using three ropes suspended from each front bolt target to help me get the alignment right before the battery is raised. Simultaneously, both jacks need to raise the battery up at the same time. If you notice the alignment to the target is not going properly, then slight adjustments are still possible by moving the jack slightly. If the alignment's a lot off, then the battery would have to be lowered and repositioned again. Once the battery is up, the six main bolts are inserted with a spacer to support the battery. Then the rear bolts and brackets are installed next, then the two front bolts with spacers. Now it's time to reconnect the battery cables and ground straps. And finally, the plastic undercarriage covers are installed from the back to the front of the car. So the next step is that we go to uh, test to make sure that it's working before I finalize the installation. On first startup, I get a warning. Low battery charge error. This is because the system is still programmed for the 24 kilowatts battery. Low battery charge.
but checking on Leaf Spy app, I see the voltage is at 360 volts, and I remember when we tested the battery before it was closed, it was at 360 volts. So I know it's right and proceed with the CAN bridge install. In order to reprogram the battery information system, when I tried this inexpensive CAN bridge, it didn't work for this type of battery. So thanks to my friends at Yasti Tech, I was able to get this very expensive modification module, which fixed the problem perfectly. Now after resetting the errors on Leaf Spy, I am able to see the current estimated mileage is over 200. I can now charge the car without worrying about damaging the high voltage battery since the CAN bridge is identifying the correct new battery specifications. Special thanks to my friend Hasib Ahmad for his knowledge and support. You can find more help in videos on upgrades on his YouTube channel. And Yasti, Tech, the leaders in automotive vehicle batteries and upgrades. If you enjoyed watching this program, please subscribe to our channel. Thank you.